Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. It's Tuesday, the day after Christmas celebrated. And uh, we're doing uh, Mina, Marco, and me on a Tuesday. Surprise! And uh, Mina's not with us, but Marco is. Marco joins us by Skype audio from uh, Hilo at ProVision Solar. Welcome back. As always, we'd love to have you on the show, Marco. Well, a belated Mele Kiliki Marco to you and yours, Jay. I hope that Santa was very good to you and that you were a good boy and got all sorts of wonderful goodies in your stocking. I, I worked on ThinkTech on Christmas. That's what I do. Did you say Mele Kiliki Marco? I thought you said... I did. Yeah. I did. All right. Then you're a happy guy. <laughs> so we're talking about looking, looking into uh, energy for 2017 today, Marco, and... Um, I'd like to review for a moment um, 2016, and if I miss any of the important events that happened in energy, catch me. First of all, we had Next Era, which occupied our attention for the first seven months of the year, and uh, as a result, you know, uh, cast a shadow on everything else. Um, and then finally in July, it was behind us one way or the other, and then there was a quiet after the storm. Meanwhile, we were having a, a decline in uh, solar installations. Uh, which is notable, and we can talk more about that. And then we had, uh, after, after the, the storm was over, we had self-supply, which is very interesting, and I personally wondered why, you know, it, uh, it took so long, but maybe that was because the next era thing was taking all the oxygen. Um, and self-supply also, you know, also means storage at the homeowner side of things, and that would be in lieu of uh, net energy metering, replacement for net energy metering, I suppose. And that's worth talking about, too, exactly where that goes. And then the big one, only a couple of days ago, the power supply improvement plan by the utility. We've had uh, some drafts were circulated months ago. And finally, I guess, I guess they came out now subject to the P PUC's approval with the PSIP, Power Supply Improvement, improvement Plan. I don't know how long it'll take to uh, approve or disapprove it, but it's, it's the big one on the docket right now. And um, it's got some interesting features to it. Uh, for one thing, and I'll just give the big ones, but I'd like to talk to you about the, the immediate term also. One is uh, that the utility is, uh, seems to be backing away from LNG. It's just not part of their program right now. They say they'll have to study it further, uh, and I'm not sure what that means. And then they changed uh, their own view of the, the 2045 uh, deadline for 100% to 2040. Which, you know, that's really, really interesting and good for them for doing that. I, you know, I don't know where we got 2045. Uh, maybe in the PSIP they say how they got 2040. But here we go on, a, on a, what might be a faster track, which is good. So um, what are your thoughts about the PSIP? And what are your thoughts about the, um, you know, the initial five years of it? Um, how is that going to play out? Um, what are your thoughts? Well, I first wanted to just respond to kind of your view uh, of 2016, and I you know, was at uh, Yogi Berra amongst the many interesting uh, and poignant, uh, incisive things that he said. When you see, it, when you come to a fork in the road, you take it. Well, I mean, we came to the fork in the road uh, regarding having uh, a much bigger uh, company from Florida come in and essentially take over the uh, the show here, at least for m the majority of the state's electric utility. Uh, service and the, that that road uh, was not taken with the commission deciding, like you said, in July 15th, the decision was made uh, to uh, dismiss the proposed acquisition, um, uh, and um, the following Monday, next era decided uh, it wasn't going to appeal or, or try again, and and they went home. So I think that was a, a major decision, and you know you, you can't play out a, a different reality. And pretend that next era had uh, had won the keys to the kingdom or king, uh, keys to the queendom because uh, just uh, you, you can't do that in life. You don't have alternate scenarios that you can play out. So you know, lo and behold, uh, we're working uh, with the companies that have been here now for for decades, uh, going back over 100 years, the Hawaiian Electric companies. And like you said, the power supply improvement plan is uh, a major uh, card, uh, a major game that's being played right now. Uh, in that the Hawaiian Electric Companies have had uh, now several years and several attempts to come up with a comprehensive analysis and comprehensive plan subject to Public Utilities Commission approval to uh, give their 
their their roadmap in terms of how to proceed and and the way I take uh, literally and figuratively power supply improvement plan is uh, the kind of two parts of that one is the more technical uh, part that deals with the reliability design engineering uh, redoing the grid as necessary infrastructure upgrades and so forth and then second is how to integrate more renewable energy cost-effective renewable energy and uh, and also of course try to lower costs if uh, if at all possible so uh, there's a lot to chew on from the, the power supply improvement plans that were uh, submitted to the commission on Friday probably somewhere over 2,000 pages although I haven't added them all up and uh, I haven't had a chance to take the deep dive into all 2,000 some odd pages but yeah nobody uh, has Marco you're well, a good company on that one those those people perhaps without family on Christmas and had nothing better to do and really wanted to be the first out of the gate to, to grind through all that stuff. Maybe they did, but certainly doesn't include present company, right? Those present are the company real devotees. Right? <laughs> what I was uh, encouraged to see is that, and they state this explicitly in their executive summary, which is that their focus is uh, placing the greatest emphasis on, on the near-term, their near-term actions that allowed them to make, as they put it, strong progress on achieving our clean energy goals. So I'm very pleased to see that uh, the greatest emphasis is on near-term actions, and that's really where I've focused my attention and my an uh, analysis so far, specifically looking at two islands that are near and dear to me. Of course, the big island where I live and where I've been active now for 17 or so years, and also the island of Molokai, where I've spent quite a bit of time over, over the years as well. So I don't know if you want to get into that level of detail now or want to well i mean in general what i take what i take from the fact that they uh they're shooting for 2040 instead of 2045 and that they're focusing on the first five years it means they're they're not kicking the can down the road um and i think we have kicked the can down the road in many ways you know in the clean energy initiative um but maybe this is a change a change we we should welcome um where we we get we get we get busy we we start taking affirmative action and we start doing things right now instead of putting everything off. Um, that's what I get out of this. So what, what, are they, what are they planning? Can you give us any, uh, any granularity on that? Sure. I mean, uh, for example, they're, they're most bold and audacious when it comes to believing and stating here that uh, they expect or hope to see Molokai achieve 100% renewable by 2020. Uh, and that's a scant, you know, four years away terms of the end of 2020. So I think that's about the boldest uh, proposal or, or assertion that they're making. And when you drill deeper into how they plan to get there, uh, they are relying uh, on five megawatts, five megawatts, so 5,000 kilowatts of uh, grid scale wind. And uh, having spent a fair amount of time on that island over the years, anybody who spends time there can't help but notice uh, um, signs around the island that say essentially no to big wind, and big wind meaning that there would be, you know, 400-foot wind towers on the west end of Molokai, uh, dotting dotting the uh, the land there that is largely owned by uh, the Molokai Ranch folks. And I would be beyond astonished if, uh, when all is said and done, that the residents, the 7,000 somewhat relative residents of Molokai would be supportive of having 400-foot wind turbines uh, dotting the west end of, of the island. So I think that's, that's a big challenge in and of itself. And, and second, and this kind of undergirds uh, a lot of the assumptions that Hawaiian Electric is making uh, in their near-term projections in terms of reaching uh, unprecedented levels of renewable energy penetration, is that they are assuming that uh, both residential and utility scale battery energy storage uh, is going to be uh, reliable, is going to be available, the technology will be proven, and uh, just as importantly, it's going to be affordable. And there's a lot of buzz, a lot of spin, a lot of hype, and a lot of hope that we are entering into the, the battery age, so to speak, even though batteries, of course, have been around for a long, long time as a technology, that we're entering the battery age uh, where it's really going to change the, uh, the, the grid fundamentally uh, from one of being centralized generation and distribution to micro generation with with battery storage and that's uh, it's a bold uh, hope it's a bold assumption but uh, there isn't a whole lot of data supporting uh, how just uh, 
how successful and how timely this is going to be, but it's clear to me, at least in my analysis, that as uh, Hawaiian Electric is projecting substantially more renewable energy across their service territories, is that they are implicitly assuming that battery storage is ready, battery storage is here and now, battery storage will be affordable, and it'll work as designed as it's designed to work. Well, but, but, but you know, there have been developments and improvements in batteries in the last few years, and everybody is focused on making better batteries. So uh, maybe it's a calculated guess rather than, you know, an unsupported guess. I, I, I mean, I, my sense of it is that um, you can go out and buy batteries now that will do the job. Whether they are cheap enough, uh, you know, to meet, to meet the, the calculations on Molokai, I don't know, but uh, you can do this now. Um, and that's, that's uh, better than it was, say, five or ten years ago, for sure. No, absolutely, Jay, absolutely. But the, 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 we don't have the data yet. We don't have the track record uh, of enough systems that have actually been installed that are providing dispatchable power. What I mean by dispatchable power, as opposed to batteries which have been around for utility power plants and for wind farms for a number of years now, uh, to smooth out the... Uh, the uh, the rise and fall of the uh, of the wind production uh, because wind speed of course does not stay constant but dispatchable power is where you have battery storage that takes power that is produced during uh, the sunny part of the day if it's solar or the windy part of the day when it's wind and stores it for at a minimum a handful of hours if not longer so that it can be used when the sun don't shine and when the wind don't blow when yeah. people need power the most that's where we are entering into the brave new frontier of battery energy storage. I mean, KIUC is actually installing one of the first utility-scale dispatchable battery yeah. plants in the entire country, yeah. and it's not in yet. So yeah. we don't have the data in terms of how does it work in the real world. Now, we're all super hopeful, of course, that it's going to work just fine, but I've been at this long enough to take a lot of these claims with these new technologies with, you know, a lot of Molokai sea salt. It's just something I'm, you know, wait and see how is it going to play out. Well, a couple of thoughts on that. You know, um, uh, you know, five years ago, they didn't have the software and the black boxes, uh, you know, to adapt the system to changes in uh, the renewable sources. That's one thought. Now they do. You know, for example, that STEM company out of California, uh, I think they're one of the uh, energy accelerator companies. and they're, they're doing good things, and they're, they have technology, they have software that ostensibly can do this, going in the right direction. And they're not the only ones who can do it. Um, Tad Glothier, if you know him, is involved in that. The, the, other, the other thing that comes to mind is that if you want to smooth out the curve, um, you know, between the time the renewable source is, is, is generating power and the time it isn't generating power, well, wind is a better bet. I mean, although you have, to, you have ups and downs with wind, fact is, wind works at night. Uh, solar doesn't work at night at all. And, um, you know, if, if, uh, if you wanted to approach the whole idea of having an integrated system, wind would be a better bet because it puts less uh, reliance on the battery system uh, since it's still generating even in the middle of the night. Uh, the other thought I wanted to throw at you, Marco, is that you know, when we had the um, um, Robin Kay uh, uh, objections to wind at uh, the Garden of the Gods in, um, in Lanai, there was a strong nexus between the opposition group that existed on Lanai um, and, and the people in Molokai. Uh, they were talking to each other. They were part of the same protest group. So I think your point about... Um, you know, the people on Lanai not necessarily warming to this idea is valid. On the other hand, perhaps uh, Hawaiian Electric has some way of showing them it would be better for them. And indeed, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the historical process that went on in Lanai, Hawaiian Electric made a, a proposal to the people of Lanai um, to give them bargain rates and otherwise make it sweeter. Uh, and uh, the, the protest group didn't take any of that. They, they, didn't, they didn't cotton to that at all. But fact is that maybe a proposal can be made along similar lines now that would be more persuasive, more useful to the people in Molokai. You know, and, and it's going to be a dollars and cents kind of thing. They may find that their rates come way down this way, and that, that may be uh, attractive. 
So um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't write it off just yet, even though historically Molokai has been um, protesting right along with Lanai. No, I'm, I'm certainly not writing it off, Jay, and I do uh, give uh, Hawaiian Electric um, credit for They have come up with what they call their uh, seven renewable energy planning principles, which is, again, a part of the executive summary. And number seven is, quote, there's no perfect choice. No single energy source or technology can achieve our clean energy goals, and every choice has an impact, whether it's physical or financial. So, uh, and, and I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's the same uh, in principle with the, with the Big Island as we have more geothermal capacity, certainly, than we're harvesting right now. But it's uh, it's a very, very hot subject, pun intended, in, in more <laughs> ways than one, in terms of getting us to where we want to go, which is 100% uh, renewable in a short, in a relatively short period of time, uh, it's, uh, it, the choices will have to be made. I mean, the choices between uh, continuing a higher level of dependence on imported fossil fuels versus having solar farms or versus having big uh, wind turbines. And speaking of wind, now to kind of shift over to the Big Island, they are projecting, again, we're talking near term, Jade, near terms, uh, 2017 to the end of 2021. So that's, a, a, that's, that's very near-term. That's a very short-term time horizon. And their proposal is to go from 30-plus uh, uh, megawatts worth of wind here on the Big Island, which is already in place, uh, and two wind farms, one South Point, the other in, uh, in uh, North Kohala. They're planning to add another 20, 20-plus 20 megawatts of wind for the, the Big Island. 22 exactly, 22 megawatts. And so when you look at 30 existing uh, megawatts or so, I mean that's not that's a 70 percent increase. So you know it begs the question, of course, where is it going to go? What kind of uh, procurement processes are going to be? What kind of pushbacks are going to be? And, and it has to, it has to, it has to uh, have uh, dispatchable battery storage because uh, our grids uh, yeah. on across the state can only have ha can handle about as much as they can handle right now in terms of uh, renewable uh, non-firm power that does not have storage. Yeah. So, to my knowledge, Jay, I don't know of any wind farm that's in operation in the U.S. or the world for that matter, but again, I, I'm not an expert per se in wind, but I, I know of no wind farms that have uh, battery storage, uh, dispatchable battery storage to be able to store energy for X number of hours and have it be released when, when the, the peak is... Uh, you know, taking place six, seven, yeah. or, or longer hours. So if that, in fact, is true, if my assumption is correct, then once again, you know, we're, we're blazing new, new territory here in terms of having megawatts and megawatts worth of wind and trying to, to marry it with megawatt hours and megawatt hours of, of dispatchable storage. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, uh, there's a fairly big, uh, uh, big maybe a relative term, uh, in Ulapalakua, in the ranch there. And I was there when they... Uh, broke ground for that. And uh, uh, unfortunately, there was some problem with one of the, um, one of the, wind, one of the wind turbines uh, a couple months ago. I don't know if that's been fixed. Um, but that kind of, that kind of farm um, taken together, you know, it's in a remote location, uh, taken together with the possibility of um, storage would really be a great thing for Hawaii. I don't, you know, we've done a lot with solar and we have solar all over the place. Um, and we've done, you know, remarkable, and we can talk about that in the next part of our show, uh, remarkable development of solar, but we have not done remarkable development in wind. And maybe it's time to get off the protest uh, bandwagon and start doing wind. And uh, I, as I said, uh, I think it's probably less of a, less of a demand on, on, um, on batteries with wind because it works at night. And maybe that's a new model we should follow. And I certainly agree. I think we all agree we have to have multiple sources here. And one of, one of the sources for the Big Island, I wonder if it's in the PSIP, is uh, geothermal, because geothermal is, is operating at a fraction of what it could be operating at. And I, and I think the, uh, you know, the cap on that, the glass ceiling on that, is uh, it's a cultural glass ceiling. And it goes way back to the 90s. Um, and it is not, you know, we, we should not have that ceiling. We should use geothermal. It could, right now it's operating at 38 megawatts. It could operate at many times that. Um, and I wonder if uh, Hawaiian Electric is thinking of using it. Uh, you, you run into the problem of how much can the Big Island really take? 
And, uh, you know, right now the Big Island has the highest percentage of renewables of any island in the chain. Um, so you wonder, how much can we put on from these various sources? But did you notice anything on geothermal? Not a peep, Jay, not a peep. You look at their executive summary for the Big Island for, again, the near term, 2017 to 2021, there is no mention about more geothermal. I think they can maybe tweak some more, a little bit more out of um, Puna Geothermal here in Puna, but in terms of a new geothermal development, whether it's in Puna, whether it's along Saddle Road, whether it's in the slopes of uh, of uh, the other mountain on the uh, Hula Lai on the west side, I mean, there's not a peep. Uh, so they've clearly made the conscious decision, uh, Helco has, and the, and the piece of smart dudes and dudettes uh, on Oahu, that uh, they were not going to assume additional geothermal uh, generation coming online in the next uh, five years. You know, you, can you think of a reason why they made that decision? Oh, it's too hot. I mean, unintended. Hot. It, 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 is too, it is too controversial. It is yeah. too... I mean, they've already had years worth of doing an RFP and going through that contested uh, rigmarole with folks uh, associated with Mililani Trask and, and a, an arrival geothermal group that, that their their proposal was rejected and they went to the PUC and they uh, you know appealed that and the PUC just recently ruled against them. So I mean it's it's, it's fraught politically, it's it's fraught environmentally, and. Uh, it's just, it's kind of a mess, actually. Kelco put a lot of time and effort into to putting out a request for proposals, went through a bidding process, chose the winner. The winner was PGV, the same company that is operating there now. And ultimately, PGV said, you know what? You know, we got the bid, we, you know, we won the bid for additional, uh, I forget how much it was, 20, was it 60, 60 megawatts, I think, of additional generation. Yeah, and yeah. When push comes, they pulled out. PGV said, we can't do it. Too much trouble. Well, it, it, no, I mean, it was, it's got to be financial. They, they bid, you know, X number of cents per kilowatt hour. They were going to sell to Helco over a long-term power purchase agreement. And from what I understand, I mean, they decided we can't make the numbers work. I mean, I'm sure there were other reasons involved, but fundamentally, I think it was a financial decision. Hmm, interesting. Let's take a, a short break, Marco. We'll come back and we'll talk about, uh, you know, one really significant thing that, pl that should play, may play in the legislature uh, in 2017. Um, and it could change uh, solar a lot, that is the tax credits. We'll be right back after this short break. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. to discover what is likeable about science. We bring on scientists of all ilk, astronomers, physicists, chemists, biologists, ecologists, and they talk about their work and more importantly, they talk about why you should talk about their work, why you should think about their work, why you should like their work. I help them bring out why their work is understandable, why it's meaningful, why people should care about it, why people should support science. We have a good time. We talk about current uh, events of interest. We talk about uh, historical events sometimes. We dig deep into their research, why they do, what the joys and delights and frustrations of their work are. and. In all, we, we show a, a real world of science, a real world of likable science. I hope you'll join us every Friday at 2 p.m. We're back. We're live. We're here with Marco Mangelsdorf for ProVision Solar and Hilo on Mina, Marco, and me on a Tuesday now looking into energy in 2017. Yeah, one comment on what we've been talking about that is, you know, I'm encouraged, uh, as I was saying during the break, Marco, that we, we have we've resolved some issues that have just been hanging. And... Um, you know, it's not good to have hanging issues. You know, you, you make a decision. And sounds like, well, we certainly we made a decision on next era that might have been a bad decision, but we made a decision and we didn't treat them well and that may affect future suitors down the road too bad and offshore investment down the road, that's too bad. But we made a decision. Uh, likewise, it seems that um, everybody is on David Ige's bandwagon about not doing LNG. Uh, although I suppose uh, Hawaii Gas could try to move forward. Um, and we made a decision, it seems like, in the PSIP to try to make it shorter, 40, uh, 2045. That's interesting. So there's a certain vitality, don't you think? Well, it, it's a very, uh, shall we say, fermenting time right now. And I think once the legislature comes back in a session in uh, just uh, several weeks now, it'll be interesting to kind of see where their priorities at are at regarding energy and where 
kind of bills are introduced and where um, uh, the chair of the House Energy and Environment Committee, Chris Lee, where he's at and where my, my, my friend Lorena Noe, uh, chair of the Senate uh, Energy and Transportation Committee, kind of what their priorities are for this year. And uh, there's, uh, there's just a, a lot going on. Uh, yeah. so, Keep in uh, mind, Marco, that we're having a Hawaii Energy Policy Forum is having a uh, legislative briefing. It's annual legislative briefing. Um, uh, to the legislature on January 12th, just before the opening, and that will be in the afternoon of January 12th. So uh, there'll be a number of speakers looking into what the legislature might consider doing or not doing this year. But let's talk about tax credits. You had some thoughts about that, and I'm very interested in that. I followed the tech tax credit in the first 10 years of, uh, of after 2000, and uh, that was uh, pretty much a disaster. Um, because the legislature wouldn't leave it alone, uh, and uh, Linda Lingle wouldn't leave it alone, and at the end they, they pulled the wings off it, and it, it died a horrible death in, in 2010, even prematurely, um, and it did not uh, you know, have any significant effect, not any lasting effect on developing a tech industry here. So you have to treat tech, uh, tech make that tax credits carefully. You have to look into the future about them. You have to try to figure out what their effect is going to be. Um, you know, their incentives or disincentives. What are your thoughts about energy tax credits now? Well, I've been following uh, tax credits as far as, uh, especially in the state level for the past handful of years because uh, what you may or may not remember, Jay, is that there has been a solar tax credit here in the state of Hawaii for 40 plus years. It's been around since 1976, which is the year I graduated from high school to date myself. <laughs> so who's, we who's certainly counting? can't, we, we can't honestly observe the state has not been uh, supportive of, of renewable energy, especially solar. It's been very supportive over the years. So I don't have a gross number in terms of all the tax credits which have been claimed over 40 years, but uh, the State Department of Taxation just uh, recently released numbers for uh, the tax year calendar year 2014 because it takes uh, a while to to tabulate all the uh, the returns so that's the most recent year we have data for and the, the they noted dotax noted that uh, approximately 112, 112 million dollars of uh, credits either uh, credit or refundable dollars were claimed for tax year 2014 that came uh, after 2013 which was 118 million uh, so by my math, that's 130 million in 2014, 2013, and then 2012 was the record of 164 million. So when you add those three years, 2012, 2013, 2014, you come up with almost 400 million dollars worth of tax credits, which takes the prize by far, I'm sure, compared to any other oh. tax credit probably in state history. And you also add to that the credits that were likely claimed for 2015, and then for this year, 2016. And I think. Uh, Easily, it's going to be somewhere in the 500 plus million dollar range for five years, and, and once you start getting hundreds of millions after hundreds of millions, you start talking about real money, right? Right, and so the legislature really gets real sensitive about that. Well, it, it then, I mean, the juicier, the juicy question after that is, what have been the benefits of the tax credit? And of course, that's a, it can be a very charged discussion, right? Because they can be qualitative, they can be quantitative. There are costs as well. I mean, the cost being to the money that uh, went out of the general fund. What else could have been done with that money? Well, you know, uh, I think on the whole, I would argue that there are more benefits and costs from that renewable energy technology tax credit. And uh, other people brighter than I, Tom Lodet, amongst others, have essentially found multiplier effects that for every dollar that the state general fund lost, so to speak, because of the tax credit, they got two or three or more times that mm -hmm. in terms of benefits. And I'm not enough of an economist to, to make a judgment, but I, of course I have a vested interest because I own a solar company. Sure. And tax but, but reviewing the history good. on this, five years ago, the uh, Solar Energy Association was uh, looking to negotiate, with Mike Gabbard mostly, I think, um, a ramp down of the credits, uh, thinking that uh, they, they, uh, they had run their course and needed to be ramped down. Mark Duda was, uh, I think he was the president uh, of the Solar Energy Association at the time, was involved in those negotiations. All of a sudden, the negotiations, I guess, stopped. They failed. The Solar Energy Association wasn't too interested anymore. They wanted to let it continue the way it was. And it has. For the past five years, it's continued in the same 
you know, the same statutory framework as, as before. Um, and, and that leads to all, all these tax credit uh, expenses we've had. So where, where do we go now? Do we look to ramp down? Do we look to ramp up? What would you expect uh, the legislature to consider? What are the options for them? Well, it remains to be seen whether the uh, relationship between key members of our legislature in terms of the energy sphere uh, will, uh, will be um, a productive uh, one compared to the kind of quasi-meltdown which take pl took place in, during conference committee uh, for various energy bills uh, in May. So that, that's, that's an open question. Uh, I would not expect there to be a whole lot of support to, uh, to sunset the, uh, the state uh, renewable energy tax credit. I think having it ramped down over time probably makes sense, but in light of the fact that uh, one Donald J. Trump is scheduled to take office January 20th, and he, you know, by, all, by all measures he seems to be more pro-conventional energy than, than renewables. Uh, he's taken some shots at wind especially that uh, I think there's going to be a reluctance to, on the state level to, uh, to ramp down uh, tax credits for uh, renewable energy here in the state. Mm -hmm. because, because the Fed is not going to be sympathetic um, and provide its own credits. Well, we have the investment tax credit, the 30 percent investment tax credit, which is good for another several years or so. Uh, but there is concern uh, that perhaps he might go after his, his allies in the Congress might go after the ITC, the investment tax credit, and, and try to bring that uh, you know, to an end sooner than it's currently uh, scheduled to, to end. I mean, that would be a worst case scenario. But I mean, the, the reality, of course, is that Mr. Trump uh, has written his own playbook and then thrown uh, the dogma and orthodoxy of decades worth of political campaigns out the window. So uh, I think one thing is absolutely certain with, uh, with that gentleman is that there are more surprises coming down the pike than we could possibly imagine, or as Don Rumsfeld uh, opined years ago, we're entering into uh, much more unknown of, of the unknowns. <laughs> okay, well, if, if, the, uh, if the federal government stops uh, credits, then it, it, then it falls on the state to continue them. Uh, but let me ask you this, and we talked about it earlier, we only have a minute left, but uh, I wanted to ask you, what, what about wrapping the credit, ra wrapping storage, you know, batteries into the credit? Uh, can we, should we, is it appropriate now, given the change in technology and the, and the change, uh, you know, in our direction with the PSIP and all that, um, to change the law around solar tax credits to have them include to a greater degree uh, the, the, the credits for, uh, credits for uh, batteries and storage. I have no doubt that there will be bills introduced on both the House and the Senate side that would have a specific uh, tax credit for batteries. I have no doubt. Now, whether it's going to get through to the very end, I don't know. I think our friend Mina Morita is in principle against those tax credits, so I'll be interested, to, or that proposed tax credit for battery storage, so I'll be interested to get her take uh, next time the three of us are together. But, I mean, any type of help to uh, to uh, increase the mass adoption and, and rapid adoption of battery storage, I think it's probably it's worth discussing for sure. It's worth discussing, but at the same time, I mean, again, I mean, there there are always vested interests uh, in, in the political realm who will claim that their cause and and their uh, their projects are, are are worthy of support. But of course, you know, we have a limited government, and all the causes can't be supported equally so. So that's the whole part of the political process, right, is making choices between this path versus that path. So, you know, we shall see. Yeah, now I understand some of the stuff that you teach when you teach your course on uh, the politics of energy, Marco. It, it shows. <laughs> well, just make sure when you come to a fork in the road, Jay, that you take it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, Happy New Year, man. And we'll, we'll continue this following the new energy in energy. That's, that's what I get, the new energy in energy 2017. Let's be optimistic. Let's look forward. Let's see more action in 2017. Thank you so much, Marco. I look forward to a, a great year with you. Jay and Marco and Mina will rock in 2017. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> Aloha and happy new Thank year. Thank you. Bye-bye.